continuing with the artist of the north in the 1500s. This is Albrecht uh, Altdorfer, and uh, he has the distinction of being the first uh, landscape painter. Uh, that is in the in the modern sense of a landscape, uh, where the landscape nature is is the subject of the picture. Now, there are other instances of 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 what you might call pure landscape. Earlier than this, um, uh, Leonardo would make drawings of landscape sometimes, and his and and Albrecht Durer would also, but their their interest in the landscape was more observational, scientific kind of. Um, study of the landscape. Um, when we think of the, of the modern uh, landscape type, the kind from the Romantics in the in the 1800s, or from the Dutch landscapes, it's more like uh, uh, being inspired by nature and going out and representing nature, so as to you know evoke that sense of of you know the awe of of nature uh, when you're doing a landscape. This was very new in in 1500. And uh, uh, Altdorfer, as they, I understand it, is, is one of his works is, uh, is is referred to as the very first. Though I don't think it's this one, though I've heard of this one being referred to that way. Uh, this is a, a, called the Danube, Land, Danube landscape. He worked in in Germany. He was German, and he uh, lived in some area where he worked as a painter. He was a his father was a miniaturist, and. And he was taught to, with the with the a, a type of painting where you fill you know every square inch with with uh, you know microscopic detail everywhere. It's what miniaturists do. And uh, he painted that way. Even and for normal size paintings, would have the same sort of degree of detail everywhere. I can show you some other examples. Apart from this one, uh, this is. A painting of Saint George and the Dragon. You see, it is almost all uh, foliage, tree foliage, but tiny at the bottom. You have uh, a horse and rider, and this is presumably the dragon down here. Um, the the landscape overwhelms the subject, and it looks like the landscape is the subject, and the and the um, Saint George and the Dragon is just an excuse to have a landscape. If you look up close, the artist has has observed. Lots of plants and understood just how they they work, how uh, what sort of details you need to do to to give the illusion of of lots and lots of foliage. Uh, it doesn't look as though he's gone out and copied particular things that is uh, set down in in the landscape and drawn every little little leaf of and branch of every tree. So as to get this image, he's like he he has a knack for representing it in. Uh, and uh, you know that's his style, uh, but his his aim here appears to be to to show how wonderful nature is. There is a reason for uh, landscapes coming to the fore at this time. It has to do with uh, the Reformation, the people in the north, the Protestants who uh, complained about the church. One of the, the many things that they complained about. One of them was the way the church used images in their services and in their churches, and they saw them as being akin to idolatry and a kind of a backlash against this use of, of imagery in what they thought of as an, uh, as an idolatry. They, they wanted to, to make sure they didn't do it, so they eliminated all uh, works of art in their churches and homes that had anything to do with, with Christian subjects, but they still wanted they still wanted works of art, so they had to pick neutral subjects, folk subject, subjects like landscapes, uh, genre scenes, uh, still lives, things that uh, if they had any kind of, of subject matter other than what it just obviously is, it was a subtle hinting at some other sort of meaning, maybe a allegorical meaning of some sort, uh, maybe a morality imagery. Uh, or interpretation you could have of it, but most of all, uh, they they wanted images that were not religious images for their homes, and uh, uh, landscapes fit the bill. They were very pretty, and and people were, you know, 
understanding that you know nature is 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 wonderful and awesome, and you can use nature as a kind of a you know showing the the the, the wonderful works of God uh, without overtly being a, a religious theme. Now Altdorfer, uh, we'll look at back at the uh, Danube in, in a second, but I'll show you another kind of thing that he did was uh, these, these these military battles. He had a uh, he had a client, a, a, a king, who, who wanted to, him to represent, you know, famous military battles, and this is a landscape um, with a with a you know a large number of figures in it, representing the battle of Darius versus uh, Alexander from you know 300 BC, and we see here the you know he's he's made it an imaginary landscape with. With uh, with this battle going on, and, the, and as a miniaturist, you know, we could fill it with the, all the microscopic detail that that anyone would ever want. Uh, you know, every every figure is drawn, and every pike, and they're almost like like he's drawing ants. When you look at this landscape he's created, you know, it's 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 a fanciful thing. It's it's as if you're looking south from Turkey over into the the eastern half of the. Mediterranean with uh, Cyprus here, and um, uh, this is the mouth of the of the Nile and the Red Sea. So he's he's created a, a a miniaturized version of the Earth we're looking at from a from a from I guess I'd have to be way up in the sky to see this this battle to give it a kind of an, an epic grand tour about it. Uh, but again, thinking of him as a as a landscape painter. This, even though this is a battle scene, it's painted as if it's just landscape. Another thing about it, this is, is interesting to me, is as as an art historian, is that this is a. It seems to be looking forward in time. This kind of of sky, this kind of uh, uh, romantic image of nature, is is something that we're going to see in you know in the eighteen hundreds. Uh, the Roman, the, the German romantics like, uh, um, right, uh, Caspar David Friedrich would be one who, who sort of, of reverential images of, of nature that inspire awe. No, I, I like this, this kind of stuff. I mean, there's this is super detail of, of things in a picture that you, you could lose a, use a magnifying glass to see all the neat little things that the artist has put in. And it's neat. This this is this could almost be seen as grass, uh, because of these pikes of soldiers they look like blades of grass in the context of the painting as a whole. But let's look back at the the Danube landscape. It's a it's just a beautiful, quaint, uh, non-specific kind of place. It's a it's an idyllic, I guess you could think of it as a landscape where the artist has, though he's made it very very realistic. You can we you don't know, have a great great uh, detail on this it's it's a little little fuzzy but you can see that he's 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 put in all sorts of information of trees and the shadows of the trees and the uh, uh, the road here going down into a little uh, I guess an idyllic village in the in the background and some some mountains then you have this sky with the sunset and the different color changes you have in the sunset and the way the light underlights the the clouds and and all sorts of neat pretty stuff of nature um this will become a uh you know landscapes will become a normal thing in the next century but the the fact that this is looking f looking f forward it's uh is 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 the first of its kind okay next we have a painter in France. He's a, a Flemish painter named uh, Jean Clouet, and he's um, he's the court painter for Francis the First. And this is a portrait of Francis Francis the First. This painter specialized in portraits. And um, when we look at it, you see that it contains all of those features that we've seen in many of the Nordis, northern artists going back to, to the 1400s. It has the super detail of surfaces and materials so that so that you can you can read every object every surface and know what they are and you know it's as if he he stuck in stuff just so that he could 
render it. That that's the same thing we've seen. Um, Petrus Christus, Jan van Eyck, uh, van der Veen, Hugo van der Goes, all those people, all those you know, the, the northern artists from the from the 1400s, you know, they established this is what paintings have to have. So, and this is is, is consistent with that. There was also a trend that we saw many t examples of that even though surface details are are um, you know practically photographic, the drawing has some oddness to it. It's like they don't have the same interest in everything existing in space, in a rational space, the same way that the Italians do. And here, there is something sort of kind of a distortion about about the figure that is different from the kind of realism you see with the surface. Here, the artist has created a kind of distortion for a certain effect. I mean, this is a an artist who's painting a picture of a king, and you know he he's he's under a lot of constraints when you're painting a picture of a king. The king has to like it, and you have to really show off and make the king look good in such a way that the way the king wants to look good. He's distorted the figure so as to make it large and imposing. He's made the body, the upper half of his body, so big and stretching out throughout the whole bottom half of the canvas so as to make him very imposing. We appear to be looking up at his face, and his face um, has a different way, it's rendered differently than, than the rest of the, of the figure. Look at the, the modeling, for example, of this, this drapery, I guess it's silk, uh, silk drapery that's, that's on his sleeves. It, it, it is modeled in light and dark, so it's, it's a large contrast between the light and dark. So you see the strong sense of the volume of everything, the, the volume of the sleeve as it gets darker under here. Um, this is, this is everything strongly illuminated so as to, you can see just what the thing is in space as far as the, this, these textures go. Uh, but the face in this, like his neck, doesn't, doesn't seem to have any volume at all. He's flat. And his face, the, the same sort of modeling doesn't exist for his nose and his cheeks and, and around his eyes. This is, he, it kind of makes him look like a playing card king rather than a, a, a like a photograph of a, of a king. It's like a, if you drew a line here and everything down looks photographic of a person, whereas everything up looks like a, almost a, a stylization version. Uh, one of this, one you know, way of thinking of this is a, a way to say, why does it look like this? Is because the king probably didn't sit for the entire time it took to paint this painting. He's busy. He's a king, so he was only there for a brief time when the artist did a sketch, a quick sketch, sketch of his face, and then someone else sat for the uh, rest of the painting, uh, wearing the king's outfit, so as to the artist could take as much time as he wanted getting that uh, perfectly realistic. But there's also a, a style, a a. a, a a style reason for it. That is, he wants the king to look more imposing and to me, mother, more, uh, uh, I guess not like idealized or, or, or made into a, uh, a timeless fashion. Uh, there's something, uh, in, you know, eternal about the way he looks. Stylized the way he is, he's, he's kind of flat and his, and his shoulders fill up the space and he's, um, you know, his chest doesn't, doesn't have the, have that volume either. It's just the sleeves have the volume and it's like, he's flat up against that red background and he's, you know, kind of like a playing card. Uh, it's neat that, that, that background has, you know, fills it up so as to not to have any, uh, distance in the background. We've seen several portraits of people who, who had, um, you know, the, the, their their body and their face are all in the foreground, and then there's a, a, a vista behind them. But in this case, this not having that is a way to make the figure more imposing and more timeless. There's some, some more uh, portraits by the same artist, uh, Clouet, um, just someone who's not a king. Again, he has the same, you know, photographic detail of every every surface and texture. 
um, and there's also uh, some stylization going on. He's he's not he's not perfectly accurate with with every uh, with with the drawing, but only with the with the with the textures and surfaces. There's another one, and uh, here's one that reminds me a lot of uh, Hans Holbein. If you ever uh, look at we we have him later, but when the we, the one that's of his that looks like this is is not one that we're we're going to be studying. But if you look up Hans Holbein, uh, there seems to be a lot of relationship between the two. Both artists work as um, um, painting painting royalty. Uh, moving on to to Spain, we have El Greco. El Greco is the uh, Spanish for the Greek. This is what they called him in Spain. Uh, he began his career in, in the island of Crete, which was a, uh, one of the pope's uh, colonies or protectorates or whatever. And uh, he, he was a Byzantine icon artist as a young man. But early on, he I guess in his 20s, he, he moved to Venice and studied the, the paintings of Titian and, and the other uh, Venetian masters at the time, to Toretto, uh, uh, Paolo Veronese, and he was able to uh, absorb into his style the various uh, distortions, paint style, uh, feathery painting, uh, uh, painterly kind of application of paint, and uh, the distortions of figures and the color sense of the Venetians and the other you know, mannerists, and put that together into a style it was just all his own. We're going to see things that are just so different from anybody else before or since. Um, he then, after he left, after he left uh, Venice, he went to Rome for some time, and then and then eventually went to Spain and settled down in Toledo. and And he worked the rest of his life, and and he painted lots and lots of paintings, and and he was. Uh, he just created this style, and, and Spain, you know, it seemed to be an odd place to be for this, this artist, but it was the, by him being here in Spain, he, he, he influenced the Spanish painters from, from then on. We get to the Baroque, well, we can look back at, uh, at uh, El El Greco, we've seen the roots of people like uh, Velazquez, and then later when you get to Goya, you know, his roots, you know, go back to, to El Greco. Anyway, um, this is a painting of, of uh, it's called The Burial of Count Orgaz, and Orgaz is this figure here. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's being lowered into his grave at his, at his funeral by St. Augustine and, and St. Stephen. Apparently, even though he lived in the, I believe it was the 13th century, and uh, he had, when he was being buried, uh, he lowered in, in his grave. Uh, it was a miraculous visitation by St. Augustine and St. Stephen, uh, who came and lowered him in his grave, I guess as, as a way to show how he was, how special he was as a uh, benefactor of the church. There are two worlds being painted here. One is um, above, the, from, from, this, from this line of heads down, there is a funeral going on, and it has, there's, looks like it's St. I mean, like St. Francis here, uh, there's St. Stephen and St. Saint, Saint Augustine. We have a priest, and we have a line of heads here of, of contemporary uh, people, but in the, in the position of the people witnessing the funeral. Um, and the style that's going on here is, is relatively realistic. All the surface patterns, if we can take a little closer look, the surface patterns of things are like the, the Flemish do. Or like, um, or like they say, Paolo Veronese, or one of the one of the Venetians, where all the surfaces are, are made, uh, you know, lusciously with with illusionistic painting of, of all the surfaces to make them look real, the 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 armor and the lace collars and all all that sort of thing, though they are relatively painterly compared to say, you know, Florentine painters. But when we get into the world of the What's going on in the sky? And you notice there is a, an odd spatialness to it. Uh, the 
the, we don't see the place that all these things are happening in. Even though there's a burial and he's being lowered into his grave, there's no grave, and there's there's hardly any any space for these people to to stand in. They're just sort of filling up the the, the picture without any clear indication of space, which is a mannerist thing. Uh, Tormo would be an example uh, of a mannerist who who has paintings where there's ambiguity of space, or at least there's no information about space. And then straight up above them is, is like another painting of of heaven and the spirit of Cork Cattle Gas is, is this little infant looking thing going right here, being held by an angel and assisted up into heaven. We have Jesus in the clouds with uh, Mary and uh, John the Baptist, St. Peter over here, and other saints, uh, lots of the heavenly hosts up here. And uh, its style is different. It's more distorted. It is a more spiritual kind of world where things are not as material. The, the paint is, is much more feathery, um, not blended. The figures themselves are elongated and, and distorted. And there's lots more color. Uh, just big yellow bit of color here, a bunch of red here, and some blue. Um, he, he, the same sort of colors that you know, Paolo Veronese would have, or, or some of the other Venetians. So he's, he's, you can see his, his, his Italian roots, or his Italian training uh, in his style, but there's nothing, you wouldn't mistake these for any of those painters. Uh, Pontormo, for example, would have you know, elongated fig figures, and uh, who else? Uh, uh, Parmigianino, the, the, the figure that's in the bottom of uh, Madonna the Long Neck has these sorts of proportions, and this is you know a mannerist thing is to is to is to have these expressive figures that are that are oddly distorted in this in this way, but none of this it's 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 not like those in any other way. Like this doesn't look like a Pontormo figure. Uh, you know no, nothing looks like 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 in Pontormo. Pontormo in any in any other way or any of the other the Venetians you know superficially the color and the and the surface texture but those Venetians didn't do figures like this so he's 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 taken different characteristics from different people and blended them together and made made a, a new thing that is just all his own uh, you can point out that. Uh, there are two figures here, and they're looking out at you. There's this boy here and this man here. This believed to be his self-portrait. I think we can another image here. This is uh, this is supposed to be him, and also this is his son uh, in the picture. Uh, your book says it uses the word mystic uh, to describe him, and mystic is is is. Is a kind of a religious person who has a much more emotional connection to you know, uh, uh, has a, has a, a religious experiences that are very emotional. Um, sometimes put you know put into some sort of uh, a, a, an odd mental state kind of kind of thing, and there's that's that's applied to a painter being a mystic. It might be a, a way of expressing just how different or otherworldly his paintings are compared to to other people, and even other painters who are religious or you know have, or devout Christians painting Christian subjects, but none of them sort of distort things the way he does, and he's like it is a very personal style. Here's you know give you examples of other other things. I mean this this. He has paintings like this that look like they weren't even painted in the 1500s because nobody else in the 1500s, even the 16 or 1700s, that there's anything like this. This looked like a 20th century painter. He, he has lots of pictures like this, saints, here's Christ, uh, all looking up in, you know, looking up in, in, in a spiritual way, looking to heaven, and, you know, there's this wet glare on their eyes and their... Um, very, very devout, and that that sort of personal relationship uh, uh, to the divine is 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 expressed through this this sort of 
uh, you know, otherworldly type painting. This is uh, Christ in the um, driving the money changers from the temple, and the action in it, the motion, the chaos in it is all. It was really mannerist, and every but the the absence of substance. You know, there's it, it's just paint on. It's hard to interpret as anything other than just loose paint on the surface, and it just sort of coincidentally looks like people in some in some instances, but it's mostly about the paint, and uh, and he sort of went further in that direction than any of the the Venetians that I'm aware of. Or, or any of the other uh, artists that I'm aware of for this for this century. Okay, next we have uh, Hieronymus Bosch. He's a he's another strange one. Uh, the work that we have is a is is called the Garden of Earthly Delights, and it's difficult to to, to explain this at all. Um, in fact, I don't know that it can even be. Explained. Let me zoom in out so we can see the whole picture. This is the whole picture. It's a triptych, like a, an altarpiece, but it's not an altarpiece. It wasn't made for a church or, or any religious reason. It was done by a secular client or a secular um, patron who, I guess, wanted him to make something that looked like an altarpiece with a, a square panel in the middle with panels on either side that close and, and have a, a painting on the outside. This is um, this is what it looks like on the outside, and uh, the subject is very odd. And and it's you know I don't need to go into to all everything about it, but uh, I sent a link to uh, to Canvas so as to that you can see a a website where when you look at that website you can click on the different points of the of the picture. Uh, where it has little icons, and you can, and it will tell you what things mean in it. Basically, you have on the left panel something that's clearly Adam and Eve, and it's done in a, in a, in a style. I'll get about the style of it next, but uh, um, just say that there's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden kind of imagery here, and then you have a world filled with uh, with people doing all sorts of strange things, and on the right side you have what appears to be hell, in made in the in the manner of Last Judgment paintings, where you have, uh, say, Christ in the middle judging uh, judging the people, so that the, the people on one side would be going to heaven, and the people on the right side would be going to hell, and, the, and there would be a depiction of hell. It's dark, and there's all sorts of torture and horrible things. So. Uh, it is like that the, that type of painting in that it has hell on the right side, though it isn't like a Last Judgment in any other sense. Um, let's look at the the figure here on the on the left. The figures of of um, Adam and Eve. Let's zoom in on this. Um, this looks like a, a retrograde kind of style. It doesn't look like uh, anything else in the North at this time. It looks like it's going back a hundred years to the Limburg brothers. This is a, a, an image from the book, the, the Very Rich Hours of the Duke de Berry that we saw with the February page and the, and the January page. Um, this is a, another page from that same book. And the figures of, of Adam and Eve are, are little dolls. There's a, a certain type to them. You know, that the, the, the artist has a certain type for, for people and, he, and he, he makes the same one each time. Um, the figures are... Well, they look like this. <laughs> don't need to characterize them. This is what they look like. They have a certain stylized version to them, and they don't seem... They look like little toys of people rather than any attempt to look like real people. Well, the Bosch is... Uh, uh, it's like he's taking that as a, as a way to represent people. And so, you know, the, the, they look like little dolls, and... and Eve, especially her relationship, spatial relationship to the landscape she's in. She seems maybe kneeling down on this bump of the landscape, but in a way that doesn't is not really convincing. But he's deliberately showing a, a, a retrograde kind of style for for whatever artistic reason. Um, he certainly 
perfectly capable of representing three-dimensional objects in space. You look at this tree in its shadow, and, and it, it looks pretty perfectly real, and all these other trees and all these other objects that are in there seem to be uh, realistic in the sense that they, they're convincing as object in space and in their detail and everything, but the, he stylized the people in this particular way. He's also filled the, the, the world that this painting exists in um, with all sorts of animals and creatures, some of which, many of which, are, are, are bizarre combinations of, of, of real creatures or think, fanciful things that he just made up. Um, here's a, some sort of bird with three three heads. There's a seal here with uh, the feet of a, of a, of a dog. Um, he combines fish and reptiles and birds and mammals, pieces from one and another added together to make to make all sorts of weird creatures. And we've seen that before in uh, like Schongauer's work and uh, uh, the, the Temptation of St. Anthony and also in the uh, the crucifixion by in the Isenheim altarpiece also had uh, one of its panels had some some monsters that someone uh, that are combination animals like this and the people in the north they like uh, distortion and sometimes ugliness and sometimes just weird monstery kind of things to put uh, to put in pictures and, it, and one of its the reason to do it is to just to show off your imagination it's very unlike the Italian uh, way of looking at the world where you want to do the ideal of something. This is the, you know, this is the opposite to wanting to see what things look like that are as far from the ideal as possible. Though the world that he's, he's depicting here is a kind of Garden of Eden in a sense. It's pretty and colorful and you have all these little, little animals running around and, and in the wildness of nature is just is this bizarre um, kind of creatures that he's, that he's populated the world with. Now, uh, you can look at that website to find out what all these things are mean, or, or at least to the degree that they that they know. Many of the things are, are not known. The people speculate uh, certain animals, like owls, have a certain meaning. Uh, birds have a certain meaning. Uh, fruit. Um, but there generally a kind of a, a sinfulness going on here. It's some sort of, of maybe a, a allegorical allegories about sin or just about the, the the nature of people and 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 how they are in the world and but you know it's I can't explain it it's just one of those um, personal visions combined with whoever the the patron was who wanted something that would be a I guess a, a conversation piece, something that, that he would, you know, people would come to his house, he would parties, and he would show them this, and they would marvel over it, and it's just, just you know, endless discussions on all the different meanings, and you, you can imagine all the kinds of, of, of things that, things that symbolize things, or, you know, probably verbal puns that are occurring, because, you know, you can't tell what they are, because they're, they would be in Dutch, or, or Flemish. Um, the the world of, of hell is wonderfully rendered as you know dark um, um, you know sinister place uh, in the vein of, of hells that are depicted in last judgments though it has oddly uh, musical instruments as torture devices it also has um, you know this it's a common feature in uh, in last judgments to have Satan represented as as eating, devouring people and excreting them, and I think I think uh, in Padua, uh, what is it? Uh, Giotto's Last Judgment? I think has something like that in it. I don't know that Michelangelo's does, but it it has similar sorts of dark imaginings of what hell is. Uh, but this just goes beyond anything. The the things that the kind of imagery that that is created here. Um, this isn't something that we can compare to anybody else as a, as a style because it's just, it's just all his own. Look back at that, um, the closed picture. This is a, uh, this, the fact that it's painted in uh, Grisey um, 
is like those uh, altarpieces that are like this. When they, when you close them, they're they're very plain on the outside. Maybe uh, the the Ghent altarpiece would be an example where it's painted in grise on the on the outside, and you open it up and to get the to get the color. All right, our next our next artist is uh, Quentin Massis, and he's a uh, um, he's is an example of an artist who's looking back at the past um, of the past century uh, for for inspiration, and it's it's interesting juxtaposition with Hieronymus Bosch because you can see he's making reference to things in the past that that Limburg Brothers image that I saw of the of the of the Adam and Eve that's a that's a reference to something in the past, and there's there's other artists. Uh, do sim similar sorts of things. Um, I can't think of, 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 of the other instance I, I had in mind, but uh, uh, we just went through a century, the 1400s, where he was characterized by you know beginning in a kind of a primitive way and and building and progressing towards naturalism, and it wasn't naturalism. It wasn't a very strong naturalism at the beginning, just simply because the the artist had not learned some things yet. It's like the the tools were still new to them, and they were developing things. But the, you could you get this sense that throughout the whole 1400s, the artists were looking forward. They're always progressing, look, you know, looking looking towards the future. And when we get past 1500, we have this sort of uh, introspectiveness where they're looking back and and looking making reference to things that occur before them um, I guess I guess the other example would be the the mannerists who were looking back at, at references and quotations from from high Renaissance artists putting in their works to you know for whatever reason they were doing I don't I don't know if it's the same reason that that anybody in the north was doing that, but I guess it's just the way things go. Uh, with that that trend that I was just talking about for the 1400s, after you get to the 1500s, and and people they're as, I guess on top of the game. You know, they 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 know how to represent everything that needs to be represented in paint, and it's just a matter of of to do something new, you have to find something, um, some other source, and. One of the sources on, for some of these artists was to look back at the past. Now, this is, this is an example. This uh, Massis. Uh, the example I was going to show was is this picture from uh, from Petrus Christus that we saw uh, before the midterm. This is the, the the goldsmith in 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 his shop, and this looking at this picture and then looking at this picture, you can see that that there's some sort of deliberate. Uh, quotation from it, or it, it's possible that this picture was, you know, at the time that it was made, many pictures were like it, and the one we're looking at is is about that type of picture, not necessarily this one. But if you look at this, it has uh, a, a goldsmith kind of shop, uh, and it's got a uh, this mirrored picture, this convex mirror in it. We saw, we saw before in a couple of instances of that before, and to make a reference of that in the 1500s, you know, it's like everybody has seen that little thing of the of the of the mirror. Um, this artist Massis has it's like he's he's he, he's relooking at the same kind of image of a well in this case it's a it's a money uh, changer someone who um, takes money that people have when they have to do like foreign exchange, uh, foreign currency exchange, he would be that kind of person. He, you, come, you come to him with your uh, money from one country and he'll change it to the money of the, of, the, of the country you're in and charge you for it. Um, the style of this, if you think of it as, as a quotation of this, this looks primitive by comparison. The figure of this woman, for example, look at her hands, how small they are in relationship to her body, the size of her head, the, 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 the absence of any kind of uh, structure underneath her clothes. That's, a, that's looking 
um, it, it, it's, it has more characteristic of the early part of the century than the later part in terms of the progress towards, towards naturalism. This looks like you've already gotten towards naturalism so that they could render all the stuff, all the people, everything in space with, you know, some degree of accuracy. I mean, much a greater degree of accuracy, I should say. Um, the, the, the coins on the table and everything is, is done with, with even greater uh, fidelity to the, you know, the visual phenomenon of looking at, at real objects in space um, than, than, than this artist had, that, that Christus had. Also, Christus has that you know early 1400 sense of just pattern and for for decorative reasons, whereas this does look doesn't look so much decorative as wanting to show you the stuff and what what the stuff that actually exists rather than just adding stuff for the purpose of of uh, of decoration. Um, as with the the paintings of the 1400s. And of the, of the north, this is, this has all of those um, suggesting things that are real, but they also suggest some sort of allegorical or religious or uh, moralizing principles going on. The fact that this this woman is is looking at a book. Um, this is, is a book of hours, and she's looked up from her book to look to see what her husband's doing with with the money. He's weighing money, and, and this suggests judgment. It also has to suggest. Um, you know the sin of of avarice, I guess, of greed, and uh, um, there are you know ways of interpreting this in such a way that you know she she's lost her focus, she's looking this way, or there's some sort of judgment of of him. Um, there's all sorts of ways you can interpret this, but you can be sure that who when this was painted, there was an intention of some sort of meaning of for all of these things. Why why for example, there's a uh, a painting of a person reading who is focused on a book in the in the uh, in the mirror here, and you know there's a church spire in here. So there's 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 references to things with meanings that's that's you know more subtle. In fact, they're so subtle that that you know they're you know in people who interpret this may come up with different interpretations. But there was probably some intended meaning. Looking at all the things on the shelf and comparing them the way they were represented in this painting, uh, you can see how this looks like 1400, you know, and, and the things look pretty and they're, and they're, they're realistic in some sense, but they're not drawn that well, I guess you could say. Uh, whereas these are, all these are drawn perfectly well as, as, uh, as observed objects in space and their textures and they're, and they're not made to look pretty. They look to, they're made to look like things actually there. And they just look however those things actually look, so that we can um, um, get a sense that this is this is this is the real world, rather than some pretty decorative world. Okay, this last one is uh, Peter Bruegel, the Elder. I had a son, uh, also called Peter Bruegel. Uh, that we're not going to be looking at, but uh, this one is a, a, a Flemish artist who uh, he specialized in, in more landscape kind of paintings as later in the in the 1500s, and uh, this is part of a series. It's a series. Uh, I think there are five paintings in it. Uh, they may have originally have been six, so that each one. Uh, the series was the, the months of the year, but it, uh, each one represented two months. Uh, instead of having four paintings with one for each season, uh, it's divided, in, the year's divided differently. Uh, but in this one, this, this would be the January, I guess December, January, uh, dead of winter scene. And the, the other one we're going to look at is, the, is a harvest scene. But Broyle was uh, specialized in, in peasants, uh, pictures of peasants. Like this, this would be a typical sort of sort of painting by him, with uh, you know, filled with peasant scene, sort of similarly to the as if they're seen through the same eyes of the uh, 
the Lindbergh brothers, back with the very rich hours of the Duke de Berry, the, the February page, for example, of, of looking at peasants and seeing exactly how they live their lives so as to show people who aren't peasants. Uh, in this case, the, the clients. Uh, though they're not royals, they're people who are much closer to the peasants, peasants than the royals were than the, the Duke de Berry was. But they're, they're still way up above them, and they look that, at them in a kind of a, a quaint way, but not quite exactly in the same way. These are more... They show, show the, the peasants in a more noble way than, than they would have um, back in the, in the 1400s. But it's sort of like in the way that uh, uh, in the Portnari altarpiece, those, those peasants, the, the, the three, um, what do you call them, shepherds in that painting, the, 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 they're, they're individualized, they're, they're, they're represented as real people worthy of, of attention. Now, Royal shows them as people worthy of attention, but he doesn't individualize them. He makes them into types. When you look at these these faces, they're almost like caricatures of a particular type of person rather than a specific person. Oftentimes, he doesn't give you the face at all. He covers them with hats. In fact, their clothes are what are what he's painting rather than the people. Um, it's like they're they're born and raised and in their clothes. He also paints, uh, uh, this is a, uh, the Tower of Babel. There's a couple of, of versions of this. And they're, they're beautiful, wonderful renderings. Um, this, this happens to be a really high res image. And he gives you the grandeur of, of, uh, of this work, you know, with tiny little people with, with gigantic architecture. This is almost like, a, uh, like something the Italians would do, <laughs> that is, show, showing size and scale and things in space is not not a particularly specialty of, of the Flemish. Uh, here's another version of it. It looks like it's he's seen the inside of the of the Colosseum, and he he did go to Italy and see and saw some things, but he he didn't bring back a lot of Italian stuff. I mean, most everything that he that he shows has the sensibility of of the of the Flemish. Though this particular thing, I guess, the, the grandeur of this and the size of this and the, and the detail of the interior structure of the, of the Colosseum would be Italian things. Otherwise, it's, it's very Flemish. Um, here's another, uh, some other examples. When he has landscapes, he, uh, he tends to, to flatten them out. He doesn't, even though they're, they're giant vistas sometimes, he wants to, he does things to, to, to make things that are far away look closer to you. Uh, and we'll see that when we get more detail on that winter scene. Here's yet another example of how he renders peasants and and how he, he seems to um, want you to be sympathetic to them. So let's go back to the hunters. The hunters in the snow, or the or return of the hunters. Um, this is the, the, the winter scene, and notice he's, he's really exaggerating the winterness of it, since that's the subject of the picture. Um, but it's actually true to life because in the middle of the of the 1500s there was a, a mini ice age where Europe was just plunged into much longer and colder winters than they had had and 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 forever and and people lots of people died because it was so it was so cold and we can see how how cold it is here it's just it's snow covered in, in like a picturesque way but there are people that are just struggling struggling to live I mean you look Look at this guy down here. He's picking off little branches of this tree to to burn to, for firewood. And you see that, you know, he's, there's a limited amount of it. Here's a, a person carrying some firewood. Um, these people are all bundled up for for all the playing on the ice, as if you know this is a fun thing to be in this winter wonderland. Um, but there's there's also a, a chimney fire trying to be trying to put out a chimney fire back here. Um, if let's look out in the distance here. There's uh, the bay out here is frozen. You know, it has to be pretty cold for you know salt water to freeze. But there's a there's a horse out here pulling a sled of some sort on on ice. This is where the where the water is. Um, what else is going on? There's a uh, there's a little trap here. So it has a bird trap and it has a, a line going into this window. So somewhere in there, someone's waiting for a bird to land here so that he can pull the trap and catch, catch a bird. 
So there's lots of little stories going on, like a, like an illustrator, like a, like a, I guess like Norman Rockwell would do, like putting all sorts of little, little extra stories going on all over the place. The overall effect, though, is one of sort of a dreariness. Uh, the 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 hunters coming in from the snow in this foreground, it are all did look dejected and they're bowed and uh, all the dogs are bowed and look like they've they they haven't been very successful in their hunt. These people are battling this fire here. I think they're singeing a pig, but you can tell that, you know, this is a this is a hard life that they're, these people are living. And part of the purpose of this, I'm sure, is to show the the peasant life and how how hard it is, how difficult it is, but also how beautiful things can be. Um, let's look at the the design of it. By the way, uh, it's. Uh, when I think of this this design of this picture, I see the uh, I see this line here, this diagonal going here to the to the center of the left side, and the same diagonal going up to this corner from this side, along this mountain here. That makes a nice V shape coming out from the from from this side, a little triangle coming this way, and there's another triangle going going that way. Uh, following the line like this branch here and then through this road to this side and then coming down this road to this line of trees and, and to make it to this corner so that he's got this um, two triangles intersecting uh, that's a that's a that's a an odd way to 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 design a, a Flemish painting I don't know he, he, he may have gone to, to Italy and seen a lot of, of Italian things but he doesn't do any kind of geometric compositional things that the Italians that, that did. He maybe just absorbed that notion from them, but he didn't, he's, this isn't, doesn't have any kind of perspectival compositional devices. There's not any perspective at all in terms of you know, linear perspective to use as a, as a geometric tool for rendering. This is just, you know, just seen. Uh, though he's he's fantasized the, the Alps here into a uh, a Dutch landscape, which is not he he wouldn't have seen, but uh, he probably he did go to cross the Alps, and he was very uh, fond of them. He did he drew pictures of the Alps, uh, but bringing them into this landscape is is a fantasy. Um, there's some neat little things like. Uh, the tree, the three-dimensionality of the tree is lost when it becomes silhouetted against the sky. It makes the, all the lines of the tree um, as graphic lines on the surface rather than as, as an illusion of, of three-dimensional three stuff, which is you know, what a tree actually is. Uh, but you know, when they don't have leaves and, and they are silhouetted against the sky, trees become, become flat. They, they, they become graphic, so like this tree back here. Um, this little device of this bird, I like this bird, is is right on the line. He's right on this line that I was talking about, or very near that line. It also is right on the line between the horizon and this and this mountain, and it's also in a in a position that's difficult to to judge its distance. It seems to be in the same world as this one, and this is just like a graphic bird uh, against the surface, not. It doesn't seem to. It seems to be against the sky. It doesn't seem to be on the same plane as the sky. Um, th this wing of the bird is like the the, the point of this mountain. Uh, so you're taking something in the distance and making it like something in the foreground, um, as a way to to diminish that illusion of space. And one of the, the the points that you get from looking at a lot of Italian pictures is that you know they they they. They like the design of the picture, and they, and they, and they, whenever they have an opportunity to make a strong illusion of space, they, they don't do it. That they, they do things that counter the strong illusion of space, so that you don't interpret it as a deep thing, because the illusion of space means that you're not looking at the design on the surface. All design occurs on the surface. So all these little tricks to keep you from interpreting that space or this as distant um, you can see it there there's an illusion I guess you could say rather than illusion of space uh, it alludes to space and you can you can interpret this as far away but it's very easy to see it as as surface pattern as well 
similarly. He does similar things to this. I don't know why it's all pixely. Let's go back and zoom. Oh, this is better. This is um, um, the wheat harvest, I think we're, we're calling this. The corn harvest, it says on my picture, though it's not corn, this is like wheat or uh, some sort of grass, grain that's going on. Um, this is the, the, the harvest time season for this, this series that, that the, the winter picture is, a, is part of the same series. And it's uh, another big landscape with some figures down here with the peasants and similarly situated in that they're in the middle of doing their activities for this season. And then you see you have a big vista landscape so that you can see um, the world as it, as it exists in this, in this time this time of the season. Um, those little things that he does to, to keep you from, from, from having too much space in the picture. Um, uh, one, I guess, is to, you know, take something in the distance and make it the same color as something that's closer to you so that they can read as two things that are on the same plane rather than as something that's far away. Another thing is that normally a tree right here in the foreground, covering up things in the background, has the effect of creating, okay, this is in front and that's behind, so there you've got space. But he makes the tree so that, like right here, it gets really dark, right at the line where you the, the, the grain meets the dark of the background, so that it's, it's almost the tree disguises itself like a chameleon, and it makes its back itself like the background, so it blends in with things that are way back there, uh, so as not to make it, so it's such a spatial difference. It's like this tree is the same as this stuff here, and then as you get farther out here, they, the branches become more graphic, like like something drawn on a surface, uh, so that the sky back in its way in the distance is is on the same plane as the as this. Uh, also the there seems to be a kind of a, you know, there's a change in the tree even to represent the, um, how its background is, if the tree's, the tree's almost transparent against the background. This big path going down the middle of this uh, grain here is made such a way that this could be, this could be a spatial cue, but he's covered it up, most of it, with this, with this figure. And he's made this line, which goes back into space, as a vertical line. So the part that would make you see space, he's covered up, and the ones that, that doesn't, he doesn't cover up. And look at these, these figures back here. This, this tunnel through the, through the grass continues on down here, and there's figures in here. But these figures are, are like these birds. You know, they're just, they're just a pattern. They're, they're little, little bits. So he, he doesn't want you to see these things, uh, or he gives you two ways to look at it. You can interpret it as what it appears to be, you know, literally, or it can be formal elements that he's arranged in such a way that, um, you know, that they're on the surface. Uh, he, he blends away the, 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 the transition from the distant, the distant landscape with the sky. He blends that, that contrast to, to, to almost nothing over here, which is another way of, of diminishing that that illusion of space. Lots of neat things about this picture. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. One of these these two, the the the, the hunters in the snow, and this one, two of my two of my favorites, and uh, I just enjoy looking at them a lot.